بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على أشرف المرسلين محمد بن عبد الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه رب شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي اللهم اجعل تجمعنا هذا تجمعا مرحوما وتفرقنا من بعده تفرقا معصوما ولا تجعل فينا ولا بيننا شقيا ولا محروما إنك ولي ذلك والقادر عليه اللهم أمين أما بعد عن أبي هريرة رضي الله عنه أن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم قال أتعلمون ما الغيبة in a hadith, in the authentic hadith, it's narrated that Abi Huraira رضي الله عنه reported that the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم asked his companions, do you know what the ghiba is? Ghiba, roughly translated to mean backbite, or to speak ill or unfavorable ways or in ways that are disliked to the person who is being spoken about. They said, Allah wa Rasuluhu a'lam. They said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his Prophet are more knowledgeable or have the knowledge. He said, Al-Ghiba and Tadkura Akhaka Bima Yakra. Ghiba is that you mention the name of your brother or you mention your brother in ways that he or she dislikes that. For example, you would say, This person is short, or this person is tall, or this person is you know too big or too small, or any of that. This is referred to as Aib Khuluqi, means that the shape or the physical uh, character of this person is disliked because of these qualities. Or you would mention them in a quality in their character, in their moral conduct, for example, or in the practice of their deen, in ways that they don't like that. Then a man asked, O Prophet of Allah, do you see if what we say is true? If what we claim in or we mention it about this individual is true? He said, if it was true, or if it is true, then you have committed ghiba. And if it isn't true, then you have committed buhtan. And the word buhtan means you have spoken of that which is unjust, unfair. You mention something that is false, in addition to the ghiba. So you've committed two crimes in one. You've committed two crimes in one. Now, we come to some issues as to what is the punishment of ghiba? And when is ghiba permissible? And if we fall, God forbid, into this trap or this sin of ghiba, what can we do to rectify our actions? And what is the right course of action to protect ourselves from committing ghiba to begin with? First and foremost, in the hadith that also uh, narrated in the Hadith that the Prophet ﷺ was passing by the outskirts of the Medina, and he saw two graves to two individuals and he mentioned to the Sahaba, his companions, that these dwellers of these two graves are being punished. And he said, وَمَا يُعَذَّبَانِ بِكَبِيرًا They are not being punished for something that is of, bit, that is of tremendous proportions. And then he said, بَلَا إِنَّهَا لَكَبِيرًا Indeed, it is something biggie, something of great proportions. The first one, it is not a biggie in the sense that they could have easily avoided falling into that trap or falling into that sin. And the second one, Kabira refers to the fact that with the sin that they've committed, they did not protect themselves against, is a sin of tremendous proportions. So, the Prophet ﷺ mentioned why they are being punished, and one of which is the subject of tonight's talk. One of them, That's another word. That this man used to walk around people with namima. Namima is ghiba in addition to trying to create hardships and disrupt relationships among the Muslims. So this person is mentioning an individual or a group of individuals with that which they dislike. And in addition to that, there's an ill intention behind that, and that is to disrupt relationships and to create friction between the Muslims. So this is a hadith that tells us that one of the reasons of the punishment of the grave is ghiba or namima or both of them. Now in another hadith, a woman also was backbiting another person and uh, the Prophet ﷺ brought a container and he told her to vomit and she literally vomited flesh, flesh and blood. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, أَيُحِبُّ أَحَدُكُمْ أَنْ يَأْكُلَ لَحْمَ أَخِيهِ مَيْتًا فَكَبِهْتُمُونَ That speaking ill of others, 
of other Muslims is like eating the flesh of your Muslim brother or sister while they are dead and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala follows that by saying فَكَرِهْتُمُ Indeed, nobody likes to do that. So literally, a person who is backbiting and walking among people with Namima is like eating the flesh of his Muslim brother or sister while they are dead. In another hadith, Aisha radiallahu she mentioned Safiya with a, a quality, a physical characteristic. She said she's short. But the Prophet realized that she said this word without a good intention behind it. He said, to oh, Aisha, this word you just said, if it was to be mixed with the water of the sea, it would have changed its color or changed its taste. Meaning that it's such a rotten word to say that it would have caused so much you know, corruption to the, even the water of the sea. So now we come to the exception of what is considered to be nima, you know, riba or nanima. There are some exceptions to that. So sometimes because we lack the understanding of when to enjoy the good and how to enjoy the good and forbid the evil, we tend to sometimes say nothing, even though we see something wrong, but we remain silent and we do not speak. In matters where you are warning the Muslims against an individual who is about to cause them harm, be it individually or collectively, it it's becomes now obligatory upon you to warn against this individual to the extent that you would deter the harm of this individual. Meaning that if this person is spreading bid'ah, acts of innovation in matters of the religion, it is obligatory upon me or you or anyone who knows to warn against this person and say this person is spreading a bid'ah in the matters of the deen. This person is mentioned in a hadith that are unauthentic. In other words, you are protecting the deen. This is, becomes an obligation. You are protecting the practice of the Muslims. This becomes an obligation. But in no form or shape, you know, you are allowed to go beyond that and say, this person is ill-minded, or this person is ill-hearted, or this person is this, or this person is that. In other words, the warning is limited to the extent that you, are, that you want to deter that harm. For the intention, or with the purity of intention that you do it that you are doing to protect Islam and the Muslims. I'll give an example. A woman came to the Prophet and she said three men have come to her asking for her hand in marriage. The Prophet when he learned the names of these individuals, he said, as for the first one, He is a broke person. Right? He has no wealth. In other words, he's not going to be able to fulfill his financial obligations towards you. As for the second one, The second one, he beats his woman. In other words, you know, if you marry him, it's most likely you're going to be beaten by him. As for the third one, which was Usama, he said, Usama, Usama means that he's recommended Usama as the right uh, person, the right husband for this woman. So here the Prophet ﷺ disclosed information that is very important to this woman who is about to get married that could have been detrimental to her if the Prophet ﷺ did not disclose it. But the Prophet ﷺ set an example for us and he did not go beyond that. So here in matters protecting the Sharia, or in matters protecting the interests of an individual, okay, this is one example, in a, in a, another example, for, uh, you know, if someone is, you know, hiring people, and we know that this person, he hires people and he never pays them. Or he hires people and he causes them tremendous injustice. It becomes obligatory upon us to come and say, don't work for this individual. Don't do business with this individual. Because the outcomes are such, one, two, three, you're not going to be happy, you're going to be caused injustice. A fourth scenario is someone has been caused injustice and now they go to the judge or they go to a person whom they see that they can rectify this oppression or rectify this injustice. So they go to them and they will disclose certain information about their matter, about their case, in order, in order for them to, to receive, you know, uh, you know, the right uh, recompense, of, if you will, or to rectify the situation. So they go to complain, they explain the scenario, they explain the wrongdoing that has been done to them, and they ask for the right course of action. That is also perfectly acceptable. You know, a fifth scenario is someone who's asking for a religious fatwa. They would say, for example, so-and-so committed sin or I've committed a sin, 
or my wife did this, or my husband did that, and I feel a sense of injustice, so therefore I need the right course of action. In this case, yes, they are speaking about a specific individual, but they're doing so for the sake of you know, rectifying wrong that's been done to them. You know, rectifying the wrong that has been done to them. So under these circumstances, it's perfectly okay to disclose information about a specific individual for the purpose. Again, intention is the underlying element and determinant and criterion for determining whether this is a ghima, an anima, or if it's permissible according to Islam. So disclosing such information about this specific individual is acceptable, but this is not to be shared with the community or the society at large. It is to be shared with this specific individual that you see in him or in her that they're going to be able to rectify the wrong. You see in them they're going to be able to bring you back that which is you know, rightfully yours, but not to go you know, beyond that. Now we come to you know, another you know, scenario, which is the Bhutan. And the Prophet ﷺ said, you know, Bhutan is that you mention something about an individual that is really not true. In other words, you've mentioned something behind their back. Not only you've mentioned something that they dislike, but you add it to that and it's a false statement. You've accused them of something that is untrue. And the Prophet ﷺ tells us in the hadith, كل المسلم على المسلم حرام ماله ودمه وعرضه among the things that the Prophet has mentioned to be sacred among the Muslims is the dignity of the Muslim. And if you speak of a, an ordinary person behind their back, or you speak Bhutan, falsehood about them, this is one grave sin. Now, the sin becomes even greater and greater if you're speaking about a person who tends a leader, for example, a Muslim leader who tends to the affairs of the Muslims. If you go around and you spread ghiba and namima, and ill thoughts and ill ideas uh, you know, about this individual, most likely you are turning people against this leader, meaning that the gravity of the situation now is even of higher proportions, meaning that the intensity of the situation now and the sinful behavior has taken a different you know, path and a different level, uh, different elevation. Similarly, if you speak about a scholar, if you speak ill about a scholar, and we all, as a matter of order from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as a matter of ibadah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded us to honor the prophets and the messengers and the urge of the prophets and the messengers which are the scholars. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, شهد الله أنه لا إله إلا هو والملائكة وأولو العلم قائما بالخص. That he made the prophets, the angels, the prophets, and the people of knowledge as witnesses that there is none worthy of worship but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is honoring, you know, these people of dhikr, these scholars, honoring the angels, honoring the prophets and the messengers, and honoring the scholars, if we in any form or shape, you know, launch an offense against them, even if they said matters of the Shia that are, uh, that are wrong, one sometimes can say, well, they've said something wrong. Yes, everybody is bound to say something wrong in matters of the Sharia, aside from the prophets and the messengers. Why? Because the Asma, protection from making errors in matters of the Sharia, belongs only to the prophets and the messengers. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not give this protection to the scholars, so therefore they are bound to make errors. Now the question is, am I concerned about correcting the error that they made? If that is the case, and I will enjoin the good, and forbid the evil, and protect the Sharia, then I can go to them. In any form or shape, I can write to them, I can see, you know, speak to them personally, I can call them and say on such and such issue, I've heard you saying or using an evidence that is weak or that is incorrect. And then the issue becomes corrected. You know, the matter is rectified. If indeed they've made an error. But in no form or shape I'm allowed or permitted to go around and say, this person didn't know what he was talking about. This person made an error of the Sharia. And every time they make an error, I'm just waiting for them to make that error. And every time they say something good, I don't even mention it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ladina amanu, kunu qawwameena lillahi shuhada'a bilqist. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands us to be, you know, to stand upright, asking for justice and be just, for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, shuhada'a bilqist, and to be rightful, and to be just in given destiny. And it's nothing to do with justice that one would simply pick on the faults and the zalat and the errors of the scholars or the students of knowledge or even the ordinary people. 
But here we're talking about the students of not we're talking about the scholars because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has honored them. And the scholars say that the, the flesh of a scholar is poisoned. Meaning that the moment you backbite, you are bound to suffer the consequences. And unfortunately we see, and also the scholars are like the symbols of Islam. These are the people of dhikr. They are the ones who uphold the sharia. They're the ones who benefit people. They're the ones who teach people, educate them, give them fatwa in matters where they, you know, you know, where they, where they have no way of finding the guidance. They're the ones who teach people the Quran and the Sunnah. They teach the people their deen. So when one starts speaking out of the scholars, what are they doing? They are disrupting this trust between the Muslims and their scholars. And the scholars are the leaders of the leaders. So they are like of the highest rank after the Prophets. And as the Prophet says, العلماء ورثة الأنبياء العلماء ورثة الأنبياء that the scholars are the heirs of the Prophets. And the Prophets did not bequeath wealth. They did not bequeath dollars. They did not bequeath pounds or dinars or any of that. They gave them the knowledge. So these scholars are carrying the baton of the prophets and the messengers. And we ought to honor them, and we ought to respect them. And if they err, we ought to correct them to give them the advice in the best possible manner. Now, what is the punishment of one you know, who commits riba? Of course, in, you know, in the grave we mentioned that in the hadith, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, unless they repent in this dunya, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decrees the punishment for them in the grave. And in the hereafter, there is no recompense, there is no reckoning, except that one who was committing riba, they are losing more and more of their hasanat. So every time, you know, they, they open their mouth, as we mentioned in the hadith, you know, where the Prophet ﷺ says, do you know who is the one who is bankrupt? And when the Sahaba asked the Prophet Allah, is it the one who doesn't have any dirham or dinar or any material wealth. He said, no, it's the one who comes on judgment day with so many hasanat, like mountains of hasanat. But among the wrong and the sins they have committed is that they spoke ill of others. They walked among the Muslims with namima. You know, they spoke of buhtan, that which is false. So these people come on judgment day and they start taking away from their hasanat until they run out. And then they start giving them from their sayyat. And then they're taken into the hellfire, they're thrown upon their faces. So, so here we understand why the Prophet ﷺ says, That they're being punished, and the sin they've committed, it is not a biggie in the sense that it's not such a big deal to stay away from it. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us two ears and one mouth. But oftentimes we manage to speak many faults as many times as we can hear. In other words, the ratio of the words that emerge out of one mouth is far greater than the ratio of the words that enter our ears. We need to work better on our listening skills, and we need to adhere to the Prophet his advice when he says, مَنْ كَانَ يُؤْمِنُ بِاللَّهِ وَالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ فَلْيَقُلْ خَيْرًا أَوْ لِيَسْمُدْ That whoever truly believes in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Judgment Day, then let them say that which is good that which there is khayr in it. There is hikmah, there is wisdom, there is knowledge, there is benefit to be passed around, or not say anything. Not say anything. Because whatever you say, it's either in your skills of hasanat, or in your skills of sayyat. And when Mu'ad ibn Jabbar radiallahu anhu you know, heard this hadith, and he said, O oh, Prophet of Allah, are we going to be held accountable for that which comes out of their, our mouths? He said, Takilatka ummuka ya Mu'ad. Meaning that may your mother uh, it's just an expression, you know, uh, of someone, may your mother never lose you, or something like that. He said, وَهَلْ يَكُبُّ النَّاسَ النَّاسُ عَلَى مَنَاخِرِهِمْ فِي النَّارِ إِلَّا حَصَائِدُ أَلْسِنَتِهِمْ And is there another reason, and of course there are other reasons, but here the Prophet has put an emphasis and focus on what comes out of the mouth of an individual. Is there another reason for one to be flung upon his face in the hellfire, except by way of that his, his tongue has, you know, has, has spoken of? by the ill, the ills and the errors and the mistakes to his tongues. And subhanAllah, if we see our physical design, we see that our tongue is like behind two prisons. The jaws and the teeth, and then the lips. But yet, we manage to get ourselves in trouble by saying the wrong thing, most of the time. And nothing really disrupts relationships more than, you know, backbiting. 
and hearsay and vain talk and riba and namima and buktan and they are so widespread subhanallah they are so widespread especially when it comes to speaking about the honor of an individual when someone says do you hear what so and so did and this word spreads like wildfire versus do you hear about the good thing that this person has done yeah yeah may Allah reward him no it should be the opposite you spread the good and you prevent you know the you know the evil so if someone is to come to you and starts backbiting another person your obligation as a Muslim is to stop them this is your obligation and if you don't then you are as sinful as this individual because in Islam there is no such a thing as complacency you are the best nation put out to humanity because of your ability or because of the criteria that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you in joining the good and forbidding the evil. Namima is one of the greatest evils that can infect the Muslim community and the Muslim society at large. Can disrupt relationships, can, between, can put between brothers and between sisters and can disrupt family relationships, and can disrupt the relationships of the Muslim Ummah at large. Can disrupt the relationship of the Muslim Ummah at large. And it's been said, you know, uh, that مَن نَمَّ لَكَ نَمَّ عَلَيْكَ So if you sit and listen to a person who is engaged in backbiting, in namima against another individual, the moment you walk away, you're going to be the next victim. And that is a just punishment for you. Because you did nothing to stop you know, the nanima that you just heard. And again, it's, it's natural. Why would you think that this person is going to speak ill of another person and not spill, speak ill about you? So, man namma laka, namma alayk. Whoever engages in backbiting of others in front of you, chances are when you leave, they're going to be engaging in the same act against you. In the same act against you. So the protection that we have for ourselves is the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, is for us to be busy with our own faults. Because oftentimes somebody would, we all have faults. Nobody is pure. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, يعني فلا تزكوا أنفسكم هو أعلم بمن التقى. Do not purify yourselves. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows who is the muttaqi, who is the pious, who is the righteous. So we need to be busy with this criterion for success that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, قَدْ أَفْلَحَ مَنْ زَكَّاهَا قَدْ أَفْلَحَ مَنْ زَكَّاهَا If you are busy with the self-purification that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded you to be busy with, then chances are you will not speak ill of others. You have been busy with your faults. The moment you see a fault in somebody else, you say, well, I have my own. Let me work on my own heart. Let me work on my own character. Let me work on my own actions. Let me work on correcting my salah. Let me work on correcting my hajj, my understanding of my iman. Let me work on strengthening my iman, because that's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is looking for in me. قَدْ أَفْلَحَ مَنْ زَكَّاهَا وَقَدْ خَابَ مَنْ دَسَّاهَا Those who are successful are the ones who are going to purify their nafs. And those who are unsuccessful are those who are going to be, you know, follow their whims and desires and follow what other people are doing. So, you know, with that, I just want to, you know, conclude by giving myself first and foremost and everybody else in this room, inshallah, everybody's listening to the, you know, uh, you know, to this halaqa, is that man kana yu'minu billahi wal yawm al-akhir fal yakul khayran aw liyasfu. That those who truly believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and judgment day, that there will be a day where we're going to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and He's going to speak to us without a translator, without a media, an, an intermediary or an agent in between, that whoever believes in that day, then let them speak that which is good, or resume silence, stay silent. Man kathura kalamu, kathura khatau. Whoever speaks a lot, their mistakes will increase. Wa man kathura khatau, fal naru awladeh. And whoever his, his heirs, or his heirs, are, you know, numerous, or many, fal naru awladeh, the hellfire is more worthy of this person. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us from the hellfire. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to beautify us with the beauty of Iman. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to teach us that which benefit us and to benefit us that with that that He taught us and to increase us in knowledge. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to cause us to live as long as we live as good Muslims and to die in a state of Iman. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.